so many great things going on today. One of the greatest things is having Michaela here today. I think we need to introduce, you guys stand up and hold up this baby. I'm not going to take this baby from Carol because she'd hit me. But I want you to look at this wonderful gift from God. Stand up, Larry. And, uh, now, several years ago, Larry and Carol decided to get married. And uh, then God decided to give them a little girl named Sarah. And now, Sarah and Andrew have been given the gift of little Michaela. And uh, you mentioned the word, if you would like to get Larry and Carol to start smiling and laughing, all you got to do is just say, Michaela. And they'll take up the conversation for, could be a minute or an hour. But we are glad to have you here, Michaela. We prayed about your health. We want you to know we love you and not near as much, of course, as these great people in your life. But wow, isn't that, aren't children a blessing? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Larry and Carol growing up their children with a heart for your son Jesus. We're very thankful for Sarah and Andrew and their love for each other and their love for Michaela. And we're thankful you gave Michaela to this wonderful family. We ask that she would grow up to be a great servant of yours. She might serve you all the days of her life. We pray you'd be with Andrew and Sarah as they raise her. They would raise her with the values of your son Jesus Christ close to her heart. Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. <clears throat> There's just uh, such interesting pictures in my mind today because I had intended to give you a picture of a warm summer scene. And then I get up this morning, I'm scraping ice off of my car windshield. So even more so, I want to give the the warm summer scene. How many of you ever know where Newton, Texas is? Raise your hand if you know where Newton, Texas is. Jason Benoit, Sheila. Well, it's down near Houston, Texas. It's in red clay. And you can see big, big, big piney trees all around. And I'm seeing a picture of this piney woods where there was a Christian camp. And the camp was called Camp Red Oak Springs. I'm seeing a, a lazy river running down through this camp with a big water hole. And then there's a big oak tree that has a limb that hangs out over this swimming hole. And one guy during our swimming period would be up in that tree and he would be handling the rope because there's this big rope that's hanging down from that big oak tree. And that rope would be thrown over to the side of the creek there. And you'd grab that rope and you'd swing out over this uh, small river above this water hole and you'd swing a couple of times and when it started to slow down, then you would let go so you're going to kind of ski into the water as best you could and make a, a big uh, belly flop uh, dive of some sort off this. And if you were really uh, maybe big enough to get it going really high, then you had the advantage of making an even bigger splash. Now this is really fun. And uh, I remember when I was doing this, even though sometimes there was a cottonmouth water moccasin that would come up and get us a little bit excited during our swim period. But I remember thinking, this is really fun. You know, going to a camp where Jesus is talked about during the classes for maybe, you know, 45 minutes a day, you have to put up with a class. It was just kind of boring. But then you get to go to craft class, I get to go to, after the uh, lesson class, you get to go to crafts. And I had a belt uh, that I made. They have a little way that you'd make a, a belt and you put some water on this belt and then they had these big dies and you hit it and you could put your name on it. And then you could, and I remember for some strange reason, I decided to do the one that had Larry on it and put big red letters Larry. And I was very impressed with my skill as a, as a, a leather worker. And then I got the butt buckle and it had a big star on it for the Lone Star State of Texas. And then I put the buckle on the belt and I put it on and I put Larry on upside down. <laughs> so much like me. But soon these fun times of my youth were through and there were some hard times that came along. And that is when I approached the finishing of college... 
I was blessed to be getting married, but I was also facing the reality that I didn't know God near as well enough as I needed to know God. I felt strongly that if that knowledge of God that I had in my life, if I had died, that I would just be lost. At best, I would be like the dead dog rover, dead in my grave. At best. There were times during this period I was very astonished at things and I was very afraid of things. I went back and looked up some of the news reports that were going on in the summer of 1967. In June the 5th, Richard Speck is sentenced to death in the electric chair for killing eight student nurses in Chicago. Guess what was going on in Israel at that time? Same thing that's going on right now. Nothing different. I won't even read you the headline. And you could look at all the headlines in of that particular month uh, of 1967, a month prior to my marriage. The only, I guess, good news that I saw in there is that there was a 400 million viewers watched live the first international satellite television production and it featured the live debut of the Beatles song all you need is love. That's all you need. All this hard stuff going, all you need is love. And so, that summer, I began to cry out to God. I began asking God to help me. I think in some ways that time of the world was similar to this time right now. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Jeremiah 22. I think I have some slides here for you. What to do in times when you are astonished and afraid. I want you to look at uh, Jeremiah 22. I think we have to start at verse 13 here. Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice making his countrymen work for nothing, not paying them for their labor. Big house, big mansion, upper stories, but I'm so smart I don't have enough money to pay the people building my big house. He says in verse 14, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms. And so he makes large windows in it, panels it with cedar, decorates it in red. And Jeremiah is a prophet who is probably the very, maybe the most bold prophet in some ways. He prophesied about 600 B.C. He prophesied at a time that God's children were going to go into captivity. And he said to God's children, You are about to be disciplined the like of which you have not had till now. I'm going, God said through Jeremiah, to whip you using those people that you consider pagan. And you're going to remember this whooping for a while. Do you ever have your parents tell you you're not going to forget this one? And that's what Jeremiah said. You're not going to forget this one. They didn't. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? So you're really something because you've got a 6,000 square foot house and you built cedar into your closets and wouldn't pay the laborers the rate that they need for a basic wage with your cedar in your closets. doesn't make you a king to have more and more cedar. 
Did not your father have food and drink? And he did what was right and what was just. And all went well with him. I think when you read the story of God's people, there's no problem with God's children having wealth. Abraham was a wealthy man. Had a trained army. And Job was a very wealthy man. No problem with that in itself. But look at verse Jeremiah 22, verse 16. He defended the cause of the poor and the needy. And so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me? declares the Lord. We have hard times in America right now. Many people say, uh, let me just ask this question. How many of you either personally are unemployed or have somebody in your family that is unemployed or underemployed and looking for a job or a better job? Let's see your hands. Just hold them up. Keep them up just a minute. Look around here now. Now that's, that's where we are. These are hard times. In fact, around the world, there's some hard times. I read the story this week, and you may have seen it in the paper also. There's a Christian pastor named Yusuf Nakadanian who is about to be executed in Iran. And you know what his crime is in Iran? His crime is that he's a Christian. And they say, if you don't go into court and recant your Christianity, we're going to execute you for being a Christian. Those are hard times. And I believe these are times, at least for me and myself, I need to look deeper at what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Robert's got a powerful book he's been reading to me this week. Ask the question, are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower of Jesus? You know, a fan of Jesus is just somebody who's an enthusiastic admirer of Jesus. But am I a follower? Yesterday I was with about five guys and uh, I'm glad to see Ken Nicholson still standing back there after the attack we made on him. But it was a learning attack and, and we were trying to all learn together. But he asked a hard question, do we not substitute sometimes a one-hour emotional worship service for the daily surrender of our life to Jesus to be a servant every day, all day? No wonder he got attacked. That's prophetic. We don't want to have anybody ask that kind of question. Look at Mark 10 in your own Bibles. It's not on the screen. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. In Mark 10 and verse 32, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished. While those who followed Him were afraid. Again, He took the twelve aside and He told them what was going to happen to Him. We're going up to Jerusalem, He said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and kill him. Now, when I was looking at the troublesome times in 1967 and looking for a way to be saved, fortunately someone pointed me to Jesus. But I don't think they use this passage in my conversion experience, believe me. But as they followed along, here's Jesus saying they're going to mock me, they're going to spit on me, and they're going to kill me. And you want to follow somebody like that? Or do you just want to be a fan? 
and come and sing songs once a week and let the praise team impress you if they can? Or do you want to be a follower in these times? We don't have a problem supporting the food needs of the people in our congregation at all. We have a problem of those of us having food not being followers. I'm hearing that we have more and more people at the food bank and some of our sources are drying up. Uh, Jackie, I'd encourage you to look at all, especially the fat preachers in our group, and go over to their house and say, let me have some of that. You don't need all of that. And I'm inviting you to come over. I'll, I'll, I'll get you some. That's who we follow. We follow Jesus who said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to exchange my life for yours on the cross. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. An exchange he made available for me as a follower. Times in the midst of this situation, some of us followers, we're focused on one thing. Even now, after 20, 30, 40 years of being a Christian, many of my prayers are focused just on Larry Wishard. What does he want and what does he need? Still that way with me. For all these years. And I want to grow out of that quickly. I need to. But I'm comforted somewhat when I read John, excuse me, Mark chapter 10. Verse 35, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to the teacher and said, Teacher, they said, We want you to do for us whatever we ask. I follow you, Jesus, because I want you to answer my prayers. Yes. Jesus, you are my lucky rabbit's foot. And if you answer all my prayers, yes, I'll do what you say. Isn't it great that we had a powerful testimony in the last two weeks of how God can answer prayers in healing Jerry Eberly. Wasn't that great? Praise His name. People of faith will spread that as quickly and fast for how much prayer, how it works. We're just amazed. And Jerry's testimony in the bulletin you need to read. He's one of the most outstanding young Christians of his age I've ever met. I don't care if he is Rod's grandson. Spider rod. And I praise God for that, yes. But sometimes the answer is not yes. It's no. And I'm going to not follow. Now, these guys were kind of like me. They said, uh, We want you to do for us what we want you to do for us. I wonder if when people are worshiping Jesus in Iran or Iraq or North Korea or China, what are their prayers like? Mark chapter 10 verse 36. Jesus said then to them, what do you want me to do for you? Now this is the kind of Savior who I found in Jesus. He says, Larry, you are so selfish with your prayers. I'm going to ask you what you want me to do for you. He asked them, what do you want me to do for you? And so if you're one of those people who ask Jesus all the time for something selfish, what do I want is what I want. And he turns around and says, what do you want? And sometimes I have to say, I don't even know what I want. Because I haven't meditated and given it to God enough to know what I ought to be even asking for. And so he said, what do you want? And in Mark 10, 37, there I replied, let one of us sit at your right hand, the other at left in your glory. And there are times when Jesus will be very close to us and very direct with us. But there are times Jesus through His Word will say to me, Larry, you don't even know what you're asking for. 
You say, well, I, Lord, I want, to, I want to have enough money and resources that I can go over to Israel and go on a, a, a world trip and enjoy it like uh, my sister did to, to learn something about Jesus. That's what I want. I want to be with one of those real big, rich, famous churches so I can do everything I want to do. And he said, Larry, you don't even know what you're talking about. You can't even deal with your own business right now. And you want something you don't even know what you're asking for. There are times come, there are times come in my own life when I find myself claiming much of my love for Jesus during the song time. Y'all remember that song that Jim messed up by applying us to what it means? Make me a servant. Why did you have to mention our wives, Jim? That's a good song except for that connection. Yeah, when well, I hear that song, that's a song we sing in our family when somebody's a little resistant to take out the trash. You know, make me a servant. I got a, I got a harsh boss. Yeah, all these other preachers at the preacher's lunch, and you got a good job, but you don't have my elders. <laughs> these guys are terrible. I've been trying to get them fixed for 28 years, and I still, I still can't get them fixed. You got a harsh boss. Make me a servant. Just how do you want it done? How high do you want me to jump? The Bible says the more we know Jesus, the more we love to serve. What can I do for you? Jesus said to these selfish guys, What do you want? And then there's that thing somebody said yesterday. One side of a car has a bumper sticker that has a fish on it. The other side has a bumper sticker that's so rude and crude. A comment you couldn't even repeat in a Christian group. Which one is it? Look at my life that way. It's a bumper sticker. Different on Sunday. 11. Is on Monday 11. There are times when I answer Jesus, hopefully, Jesus says, can you drink the cup that goes with what you asked for? And they said, yeah, we can. We can drink it. There are times when it's not just Peter who says he can, but he can't. It's sometimes me. It's not just me saying on Sunday, make me a servant, but when Sheila asked me to do something, I'm busy. You're the one that's standing up, not me. So Jesus says, that cup thing, it's to identify with that sacrifice of being a servant, even to giving your own life. Will you drink that cup? And Jesus is saying you will experience the wrath of of the Jewish chief priests, the who saids, the authority figures, the politicians, the news media, the powerful religious brokers will make fun of you. You will see the wrath of God come down on people who go against God's way. Let me tell you, my American friends here, this applies to all people, all people groups, all nations. When you go against the Word of God, there's discipline coming. Put on your chin strap. Buckle up. Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 13 is that passage where Jeremiah is getting right next to them. You're building big houses. And you who are employed and you who have a house, your dollars will be worth more. I remember my mother and father talking about people in the Depression days who had money. They had a lot of money. But as you could buy a whole day's work for a quarter. In those days. And so there's nothing wrong, I don't think, from the biblical examples of men of God, women of God, having great resources. But I would suggest to you that Jesus Christ Himself said, you better be identifying with the poor. Because that's where God is. You want to get to know God, you get to know poor people. 
You want to really get to know God, you get close to poor people. You'll definitely not want to rob them of a day's wage. Because God is in them. And He's defending the cause of the needy. And what He says when we say, I'm so brilliant, I can cheat them. Would a man rob God? That's what you're doing. Just so you can build a bigger house with cedar. The tragedy of people who would steal from the poor to build another house somewhere else. That's what Jeremiah was noticing. So back to the times of my youth. My questions finally led me to a man. The man who was the director of the camp when I was 13... When I got to be about 20 years old, 21 years old, and I was really looking at the hard things in life, I thought of him. I wondered who could help me. Here was a man who seemed to really enjoy having fun at the camp. He really loved Jesus. He looked at the good things in life. And I went to see him. And you know, eight years later, he was still doing what he was doing earlier. He was pushing Jesus. And I went by his office on July the 4th, 1967. I told him about my situation. I'm afraid. These are astonishing, fearful times in my life. I feel hopeless. I feel sinful. I feel helpless. And he did something that had been done before in Scripture. I think he robbed it from John the Baptist. John Davis said, Larry... Behold, the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the world. That was his answer. Troublesome times are here. They've been here since the times of Jeremiah. And they're going to be here tomorrow. But there will be no answer in politics or which party you like or which party you don't like. The answer is in the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He pointed me there and then he pointed me to this passage I want us to look at. And I want you to look at this picture and I want us to make sure... Let's flip through these slides. I want, is this the last slide on that group, Greg? Let's make sure I'm at the last slide. In Jeremiah 24, 7, he says, I will give them a heart to know me, that I'm the Lord. And they will be my people and I will be their God. And they will return to me with all their heart. Lukewarm Christianity will not do the job nowadays. And it never would. What will do the job is 100% of all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all the time. That will work in troublesome times and good times. And that's what Jeremiah was saying. I'm going to give him a new heart. That's what the forecast was. Jeremiah lived in a hard day. Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, I'm going to have a new covenant with my children and all of them are going to know me. Let me say this. If you don't know God, you're lost. You need, to, you need to get to know God. I studied with someone yesterday who said the most beautiful question maybe I've heard in years. He said to me, how do I get to know God? I said, man, that's a preacher's question there. How much time do you have? But I really pointed him to look at a little child. Jesus said, this is how you get to become great. I point to those who need a, the poor, those in prison. When you visited those who are sick, you visited me. That's how you get to know God. You care for those who need food. That's how you get to know God. You care for people that really are hurting and needy. You get to know God. You look at the lilies of the fields. You get to know God. You look at the raven that flies out there. Has no worries. No big barns. No iris. No big mansion. And that's the way you get to know God. According to Jesus. 
chance you're going to get to know God. Because you found the right country or the right political party in the country. You've got to be kidding me. Please, let's be more real than that. He pointed me to that passage about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Acts chapter 8. He pointed me to Acts 8 verse 26. I'm 20 years old and I'm looking for some instant solution to my problem. And here said, he, he said this was the answer. It's Philip, verse 30 of Acts 8. Then Philip ran up to the chariot. He heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. And I wonder sometimes about asking myself that. Larry, do you really understand what you're reading in here? And sometimes I need to say, no, I really don't. Explain it to me. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invites Philip up. The eunuch was reading the passage of Scripture. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb for the share is silent. He did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? His life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who's the prophet talking about here? Himself or somebody else? And Philip began at that very passage of Scripture. And he told him the good news about America. Mm -hmm. And the GOP. You don't spell God GOP. You spell God G-O-D. And you don't spell God however you spell Democrats. I'll go into that one. How can we get so off message that the church is talking more about politics than salvation? How could it be? So he began at that scripture and he taught him the good news about Jesus. They traveled along the road. They came to some water. The eunuch said, look, here's some water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And they came, they went, the Bible says when they, both Philip, he gave orders to stop the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. Philip baptized him. I have never seen in my adult life, in my memory, as much interest in the gospel where people would come to me and ask me, can I get to know God? How do I get to know God? As adults, people in their 40s and 50s and 60s saying, I want to know God. I have never seen it as much so as it is right this very moment. And maybe I've never seen it. It's critically hard-pressed times economically as I see right now. Maybe there's a connection. I don't know. But in my life, I want to give them the right answer. It's not America or China. It's Jesus. And it's not some fancy guru guy who has a tent and you go over to his seminar for $5,000 and get a bunch of people killed. It's just Jesus. It's that simple. And that's what I try to tell them. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch did not see him again. I want you to look at that picture of that little baby. You know, Michaela, she seemed pretty secure in Carol's arms a minute ago. I doubt that little baby would claim that she was holding up Carol. I don't think that little baby was claiming that he was holding up that soldier. But I sometimes go around telling God, God, I bet you're really glad that I put you on my team down there in Southeast, God. I include you in some of my sermons. I have some texts that talk about your son occasionally. He just shakes his head. What are you talking about? We should I carry you everywhere. I carry you all the time. I carry you in trouble sometimes. I carry you all the time. That's what he says to me. And when I remember that, 
I can whistle in the darkness when I remember that. Because Jesus is the song that I sing. This morning, if you're worried about times that are astonishing and fearful, I would say this. Turn to Jesus. Get into Jesus. Get into the same spot that the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch got into. That's in Jesus. When you decide you want to turn to Jesus, you believe in Him as the Son of God. He's the answer. You decide you want to confess Him as the Lord of your life. You decide you want to be baptized, buried into Jesus, surrounded with Jesus, wrapped in Jesus, filled with Jesus. You want that in your life? You're going to have joy. You will have joy. I, I am sure of it. I'm so thankful to have people around me that remind me of these lessons. As you do by your actions and sometimes by your words as well. So this morning I offer myself to point you in that direction. Our baptistry is empty this morning because it's broken. But we've got plenty of water here from the Cherry Creek Reservoir to Fulton Street Church Christ. And I guarantee we can get her done. But on the other hand, I don't want you to get her done just to show off something to somebody else besides God. It won't work. So, praise God for His Son Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world.